So I decided I didn't want any Ohio State students to go out and give terrible talks, so I came up with this presentation. That's what motivated all this. Okay, now let's talk about the visual aids. You've been there. This is the problem. If you're in a room, not like this nice room, but in a room where everything's flat, all these bozos in front of me, they got hats and big hair or whatever, I can't see anything below the bottom of the screen. That's why PowerPoint forces you to use the horizontal format. See, when I was young, people used to type out a bunch of stuff on a piece of paper, type, I don't know the word, and then they put it through the copier with a transparency, and then they put the transparency on the overhead. That's how we ended up with this. PowerPoint at least forces you to do something else. So use large type, right? Limit the amount of information per slide so there isn't so much stuff that people can't see the last half of it. Keep your key points away from the bottom of the slide because half the people can't see that. So when you state your key point, put it near the top. Um, state your point, keep it simple. So here's an example. Oh, here's somebody sitting in front of me. There's some small type here. I can't see the bottom half of this. I have no idea what this says. But over here, somebody's blocking my view. I still can't see everything. Lasers are good. They are bright, reliable. These are big. I can see them. And this one, I could probably take a good guess at what that says, especially if this guy twitches a little bit. OK. Now, you want to simplify your slides. I tell them what it is. I've uh, gone to a lot of presentations and meetings, and there's something about, particularly the military, they put a lot of stuff on one slide. It was as if they had to pay for every slide. When I was young, it was a dollar a slide, but I'm not bitter, but nowadays they're free. And they put all this stuff in there. It's all crammed with explosions and bombs and airplanes and text and stuff. And like, ah. No, you want to have a lot of white space. Get rid of anything you're not going to actually talk about. Okay? Then whatever's left, make the lines really fat and make your type bold. Make sure that the point you want to make is on the slide. Because when I look at my slides, I go, oh, I look at this graph, I immediately know exactly what the key point is because, hey, it's my graph, it's out of my dissertation. Other people don't know, so they need to know what the key point is. And you might say, well, I'm going to say what the key point is. And, you know, a couple years ago I would have said that's all you have to do. Now I say, you know, you got to write it on there because half the time people say, oh, I can't come to your talk. Could you give me your slides? Right? I've had uh, sponsors who say, we don't want a report. We want you to send us four PowerPoint slides. Oh, so you make sure that your key point is on the slide. Hey, here's an example of a bad figure. Notice it's the response for the widget, and here's some stuff. And it's got these little tick marks. The lines are skinny. It's got these tick marks. The tick marks are so that when you write your paper, someone can take out a ruler and draw a line, and they can read numbers off your graph. Nobody's going to hold a ruler up in the space of the room and try to read numbers off your graph. So you don't need this stuff, right? You need some numbers here. And uh, the lines are too skinny and blah, 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 and I don't know what the key point is. So what I'm going to suggest is get rid of the tick marks. I changed mu. I had a mu there before. Who knows what mu is? Nobody. So I just wrote intensity on this one. And um, I pointed out my key point. Look, the first zero is at 37. Because it's just a sine wave, but you get the idea, right? So I, first zero, and it matches my prediction. When I plugged that into my calculator, I predicted the first zero would be at 37 radians. And I made the lines really fat. My key point is here. And in addition to making my key point, I told you whether it was good or bad, right? Matches prediction is probably good. Because some people, even though they see your key point, they may not know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You want to make sure that you let them know. So here's an actual figure from a paper that I wrote a long time ago, and there's all sorts of stuff in your paper or in your dissertation or your report. You have to put all the gory details in so that somebody else could take your experiment and replicate it, right? In a presentation, you don't do that. So I have to, my paper, I have to say, well, I got in from a three milliwatt argon laser. I got some kind of gating device to make pulses. I got a reference detector here to go into the oscilloscope and a light comes in here, my input turning mirror. I got this control beam with a scanning slit, my liquid crystal light valve, and blah, blah, blah. And but yes, in my paper, Paper, that's fine, but if I show you this in a presentation, you're going to cry out in alarm. Beads of sweat will fly because you will be afraid I'm going to take this down before you have a chance to digest it. And there's a lot of stuff on here I don't even need to talk about. So what I'm going to say is I, you can study a paper, but you can only view my slides for a short time. So there's too many details. The viewer stops listening because they're trying to figure out what you've got. And so the viewer panics because they've got all this detail, and they know you're going to take that slide down before they have a chance to look at, look at it. So Remove anything you're not going to talk about. Anything that's not actually important, like power supplies. Unless your dissertation's about power supplies, then I put them in. Um, remove any non-critical components. Remove labels and arrows, anything you're not going to say. Strip down the figure to the bare bones. And then whatever's left, 
Make the lines bold. Make the type fast. Simplify, simplify. And then use color to make things stand out. So here's an example. I replaced a whole bunch of junk in this corner. There's a 3 milliwatt argon laser and a gating device. Well, I'm showing you pulses. And I'm telling you, you know it's an optics talk because you came to my talk. So you figure this is probably a laser beam. And I replaced the scanning slit and the blah, blah, blah. I just said light valve and some kind of control because the control is not the point of my slide here. My sl point is the beam comes in here and hits this mirror. And then I'm going to talk to you about where the beam goes. And I'll talk about all this. And then the beam will come out and it's still pulse. And I replaced polarizing beam splitter with PBS because I'm going to say polarizing beam splitter when I give this presentation. So you're going to know you're not going to think it's a TV station. Well, maybe you will. Oh, this is what we used to do. All of us old people, we used to stick uh, pieces of paper in a copier and make transparencies this way. And then the advantage is fiber optics. They are cheaper than wire for most installations. Fiber optics are more durable and last longer than copper wire since they are not susceptible to corrosion. Ah, too much stuff. So what you want to do is too many ideas. The type is too small. Uh, this was 12 point, which you'd normally use on, in a copier. It's a serif font, and I'm going to bing, bing, time out. I'm going to talk about serif fonts, and then I'm going to come back here. These are serifs. Serifs are these little flags they put on letters in the Ohio State University. What they do is when you're reading a book or a letter or something, and you read along, you, they form this sort of subliminal horizontal line so that when you go to register the next line, you go to the next line easily. That's what those serifs were designed for. In a PowerPoint, you don't need those. You just got. Um, Phrases, words, not long sentences if you have any sense. So uh, you want to avoid these serifs because they just clutter things up. If you go out, uh, when you leave here today, go out, look at all the street signs. They're all non-serif fonts. Look at all the billboards. Unless the type is part of somebody's logo or their image, it'll be non-serif fonts. Um, stop, the stop sign is a non-serif font for just that reason. OK, time back in. So use a non-serif font. Uh, this is a serif font. It's great for reading pages, but not for slides. It's got long sentences. You don't want that. And the audience, again, is going to stop listening because they're busy trying to read all the stuff before I take the slide down. So I'm going to replace that with, uh, I'm going to break it up into more than one slide because i got too much stuff on here. I'm going to use a big font. I'm going to use a non-serif font like this one. And I'm going to try to capture each thought in a phrase like, Advantages of fiber, they are cheaper. Now, when I'm talking about this, I can say fiber is cheaper than copper in most installations. Right? You get the idea, but what's in your, in your brain is cheaper. I can say durable, yeah, they're not susceptible to electromagnetic interference, and I can talk about lightning strike. I can talk about all this stuff, and you get the key points, but you can read those and still listen to me at the same time. And then maybe I would put the bad things on another slide. The disadvantages are on a whole separate slide, and this image problem has to do with those hideous wigs. Yeah, I know, there's nothing wrong with fiber optics, so it's hard to think of examples. OK, now, let's talk about white space. People like white space. It, this is too cluttered, too much stuff. One idea per slide. Here's three ideas. There's some words and the graph and, and who knows what else. One idea per slide. Here's an example. Maybe in your heart you wish that they would look at this equation and compare it with this graph and take some meaning from comparing those two. Well, they can't handle looking at them both at once. It would help to see them both at once. What you do is you introduce one first. I say, here is my graph. I talk about the graph. You commune with my graph. You become one with my graph. And then by the time that I'm done talking about it and I want to show you the equation, which remember, I wanted you to see the graph at the same time, I can put the graph in the corner. It's still there. It's still our friend. And now I can focus on this very important equation, which clearly I made up. It's not even an equation. And the graph is there. You can still see it. And now I can talk about this, and you can, I can relate this to that. Okay? So that's one way to avoid cluttering up your, your slides. Excuse me. If you're difficult to understand, you may want to put more words on your slide. Like if you have a speech impediment, or if English is not your first language, or you, for some reason you know that you're hard to understand, then by all means, go ahead and put more words on your slide. The point is to be understood, right? If you can do it with fewer words. I had this student once. I was teaching a laser class. And this student came from a land far, far away where they don't have the TH sound in his language. Sadly, he chose as this topic laser threshold. He couldn't say threshold for love nor money. So um, the first time he needed to use that word early, early on, he had the word threshold on his slide. And he made a noise, and he pointed to that word. And we knew what it was. So then after that, every time we heard that noise, we knew what the word was. It was a great way to handle it. Okay? Again, the key is to be understood. 
People say to try to put some kind of picture on every slide. I put a picture on the slide, you're there. Oh, it's very beautiful. What's it got to do with anything? And the answer is nothing. I, someone told me I had to put a picture on every slide. Well, okay, within reason, right? A picture does help make the slide a little bit more interesting, a little bit more interesting than just boring text, but don't let it distract from your message, okay? Uh, this says, what does it have to do with anything? The answer is nothing, but it's very beautiful, restful. Uh, maybe I have something really boring like a parts list, all right? So maybe I could put a little cartoon in here that says, oh, uh, just some visual interest. But you know what? If I had to present a list like this, I would probably hand it out on a piece of paper if I think you're going to actually memorize this list or if I want you to really know this list. Maybe a better way to do it is say, oh, here's this thing you're going to build, and here's the part you're going to need. You're going to need a piece of styrofoam. You're going to need some wire. And I could do it like this if I really wanted you to see the list. If I thought you were going to go right now and build this part, I would give you something written for it. OK? Ooh, presenting equations. Why do people do this? I mean, sometimes you have to. But my theory is a lot of people put equations up because it makes you look real smart. Ha, <laughs> I know an equation. <laughs> the bigger and the more gory the equation, the more smarter I look. Except for nobody else knows what you're talking about, and it puts people off, I think. That's my opinion. Okay? So the thing you should ask yourself is, what are you trying to say with the equation that the audience is really going to get? Remember, it's about the audience, not about you. So here's an example. This is one of my favorite equations. I got to use it in my dissertation many times. Uh, I didn't make this equation up. I got it out of a book. But you know, it's too much, right? It's got some phase constant here that turns out not to matter. There's a normalization constant that turns out who cares. I define two things at once. This doesn't tell the audience anything. What is the idea that I wanted to convey by showing this equation? Oh, well, it turns out I wanted to say that mu, whatever that is, is proportional to, I got rid of a whole bunch of Greek stuff getting proportional to V, Fourier transform of the input intensity. Now, even if you never heard of a Fourier transform, and the very idea of someone saying Fourier transform out loud is intimidating, you would not feel bad because you say, oh, this is even obvious to even the most casual observer that this is the Fourier transform of the input intensity. Ha, who doesn't know that? So then it makes people feel better. Okay? When you present plots, the first thing you must do is stop and read the uh, axes. Here I am plotting correlation against distance across the beam, or something like that. It just gives people time to figure out, because you have a dissertation or project full, full of these graphs, and they're all alike, and they have minor differences. differences. But you know what? Those of us who haven't seen this before, we've got to stop and register this. What are you plotting here? Okay. So I keep it simple. I read the axis out loud, and then I tell you what it is I'm looking for. Here I'm pointing out that the peak is not at the beam center. Okay? Now the question is, is that good or bad? Oh, I should tell you. So I tell you, hey, look, the peak is not at beam center just like I expected, or just I moved, was able to move it from beam center. Or I could say, darn the luck, that stupid peak was not at the beam center. Either way, I gotta tell you whether it's good or bad. Okay? This is a slide that I love. I was at this meeting and this guy. Paul Friedrich from GTRI, he showed this uh, slide. I'm an optics guy. This is an antenna slide. And it is normalized SCPE plane scans. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling small. Oh, I'm in a room with a bunch of antenna guys, and they look at these graphs, and they don't even have to read the axes because they know what they are. I'll tell you what this says. It says frequency in gigahertz versus angle. Oh, that doesn't tell me anything. But here's what he did. First of all, it's beautiful because it's colorful. Second of all, he wrote, no evidence of scan blindness. Whoa. That's obvious to even the most casual observer. There is no evidence of scan blindness. And furthermore, blindness sounds like something bad. So I'm thinking no evidence of something bad is something good. So I got his key point, and I know whether it's good or bad, and I still don't know what it means. Okay. Here's another one from that same presentation. I love this guy. Periodic array, whatever, design prediction. OK, so I don't care. There's a bunch of boring words. Look at what he did here. He plotted, he plotted zero, ohmic loss is between that and the gain. So gain is blue, and the line is blue, and the word is blue, right? And then ohmic loss, well, I could believe that if gain is less than zero something, that probably is a loss, and he's saying it's an ohmic loss. And then he's got another one, realized gain. Ooh, that sounds a little bit more picky than just plain old gain. He must have some more losses, and sure enough, he labeled it right there, mismatched loss, not over here somewhere, right there on the graph. Here's my mismatched loss. I don't know what you're talking about, but I can clearly see that's a mismatched loss. But my favorite part is he put 3 dB spec. And I don't know what he's talking about, but I can clearly see that his stuff is above the 3 dB spec over a very wide frequency ratio. I'm thinking this guy is pretty good, even though I don't know what he's talking about. 